Welcome, everybody, and on behalf of BioMariU, thank you for joining us today. I'm Steve Walker, and I'll be moderating today's webinar about how to enhance responses to sepsis in the critical care setting. It's my pleasure to introduce the expert leading this session, Kirsten Springer. Mrs. Springer is a staff nurse, and she's the sepsis coordinator at Mission Hospital Surgical Neurotrauma ICU in Mission Viejo, California. Her experience has cultivated insights on the role of nurses in the ER and in critical care settings when diagnosing sepsis patients, including how to incorporate and optimize PCT. As part of our discussion today, having led change within her own hospital, Mrs. Springer will explain the need to challenge the status quo in order to encourage quality in the ER and in the critical care setting regarding response to suspected sepsis. And as you'll soon hear, Mrs. Springer brings a great deal of enthusiasm and energy to the topic of sepsis. Her description of the sepsis code, which is a protocol to hasten the pace of sepsis diagnosis and save patients from preventable tissue damage, multiple organ failure, and death, is extremely timely. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, sepsis is one of the 10 leading killers of Americans, and the Sepsis Alliance notes that sepsis is the third most deadly disease in America today. Aside from the extreme morbidity and mortality caused by sepsis, the cost to the U.S. healthcare system is enormous. So Mrs. Springer will spend the next 30 minutes or so exploring quality imperatives when monitoring for and treating sepsis cases. We've allowed time for questions and discussion following the presentation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mrs. Springer. Thank you kindly for lending this opportunity to share my experience. This is my personal experience with PCT, the ED, and critical care nursing. I've been involved from the beginning of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. I live, eat, and breathe sepsis, and I 100% believe in its efficacy. Even if you do it poorly, your patients will still be better. Most facilities nationally are finally seriously looking at sepsis, so I'm hoping that today's webinar will help that a little bit. There is the current FDA claim that the Vitus Brams PCT is an automated test and it's intended for use in conjunction with other lab findings, and that's important to remember, and clinical assessments to aid in the risk assessment of our critically ill patients on their first day of the ICU admission and for progression to severe sepsis and septic shock. It's one piece of the puzzle. The IHI noted in their white paper that as of 2003, there were 1,739 U.S. hospitals in the IHI comparative database and they showed that they exhibit a 450% variation in patients' chance of dying. And that is ever true in terms of sepsis. We can certainly do better. Why is the mortality rate for trauma, STEMI, and stroke 4 to 8%? It's not because they're not critically ill. It's because they have standardized, multidisciplinary, protocolized approach that they do over and over and over again. And we all know nationally that sepsis has a wide variation in how we care for those patients. This used to be the face of sepsis. And at Mission Hospital, where I work, we have not seen this in two and a half years that we've had our sepsis initiative up and running. You just do not see it anymore. The status quo is gone. We completely do it different, and it's really through these evidence-based standardization of care practices that we've been able to come away from this. Fortunately or unfortunately, however you look at it, the efficacy of your sepsis initiative is dependent on your ability to create a house-wide implementation. I will tell you, if you concentrate on quality, the cost will follow, but if you do not focus on a housewide initiative, you're going to struggle. It's the ED is imperative. My ED staff at Mission, they are experts with sepsis care currently, but it took us two and a half years to get there. We started out with a very modest program, and we've nickeled and dimed ourselves throughout the last two and a half years. And our ED is certainly, I would call, experts at this time. Let's just have an agreement on what sepsis is. We have to have a systemic inflammatory response. And we have to acknowledge that we have a systemic inflammatory response. So often as nurses, especially in the ED, we can consider our heart rate elevated because of pain or because of anxiety. 
But when you take a step back and you look at a combination of physiologic variables that when combined are the big red flags that we have that systemic inflammatory response syndrome, that's how we're able to effectively actually diagnose. So let's have an agreement. And by the way, in my opinion, this is 2010 information. I believe by 2015 the whole sepsis campaign will have changed. We are only in the beginning of this very long process. So for currently two or more of the following, create a positive SIRS criteria. So most of the time they're febrile. We know that older patients don't have fevers, and we know immunocompromised patients don't have fevers. So they're febrile, they're tachycardic, they're tachypnic, and they have white cell changes. And really we want to look to the bands as the most important part of those white cell criteria. So we have serious infection, it's diagnostic of sepsis when you have infection plus SIRS criteria. Those patients can go to the floors. It's when you have the associated organ failure, do you need the whole sepsis initiative, early goal-directed therapy that needs to go to ICU, and septic shock. We know that SIRS is present in burns, trauma, sterile pancreatitis, but when it's combined with an infection, that is by definition severe sepsis and septic shock. I'll give you a second to read this. <laughs> it doesn't matter in what order the letters and the word are. The only important thing is that the first and the last letter be in the right place. The rest can be a total mess and you can still read it without a problem. This is because the human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. And for me, this slide depicts the emergency room. Nurses are able to look at chaos and make sense of it, just like we're able to read this slide. It is truly chaos in the emergency room. I'm a critical care nurse, but I know, I see, I'm in the ED every single day that I work as a sepsis coordinator. It is chaotic, but we still need amongst the chaos to really look at our patients and look where they were in triage, where are they now, where are they going in order to properly assess how our patients are diagnosed and treated for severe sepsis and septic shock in the ED. In my facility, part of the sepsis initiative is we actually call a code sepsis in the ED. Just like our code STEMI, code stroke, and code trauma, we do call code sepsis. In the beginning, it was kind of thought of as just a little bit of an overkill, but I believe and we know the sepsis mortality rate is higher than the other three disease states. It needs to be treated accordingly. And code sepsis allows us to bring the care to the patient. Our rapid response nurses actually respond to code sepsis in the ED. The rapid response nurses actually go to the ED. But how do you diagnose code sepsis? You have to actually call it code sepsis. That's the other reason why I like code sepsis is forces the diagnosis, because you cannot diagnose what you do not treat. So inquiring minds to know, how does one diagnose sepsis? Well, we've kind of gone over that. And ask yourself, does the patient have to look deathly ill? And actually, no. We know that 75% of severe sepsis patients with high lactates don't actually look ill. So maybe they have a little bit of um, modeling at the knees, but many, many times they're hyperdynamic. They have that for those of us who are old in the audience, they have that warm shock, the dry shock, that hyperdynamic state. They don't look cold and clammy like the CHF patients. They don't look like cardiogenic shock patients that are wet and cold and shocky. They actually don't look so bad. Their little cheeks are pink and they're warm and dry, but they are still in shock. So remember, you cannot treat what you cannot diagnose. So that's our code sepsis. It forces them to put the pieces of the puzzle together, looking at the labs, the acid-base balance, organ dysfunction, current therapies, vital signs, comorbidities, perfusion, and trending. Certainly, the procalcitonin as part of your lab armamentarium can help you diagnose an actual bacterial infection. If you have that lower rep respiratory tract infection, how do you know if you have a viral syndrome or you actually have a bacterial infection. How do you know when to start antibiotics? Well, we know once we've diagnosed sepsis as infection plus SIRS criteria, we now have to look at organ dysfunctions, acute, not chronic. We have to find out. 
look at them, do they have altered LOC or confusion? Do they have respiratory dysfunction, cardiovascular? Certainly, I think hepatic or shock liver is underdiagnosed with sepsis. I see that all the time. It's barely mentioned, but their total billy's up and their LFPs are up. Oliguria and elevated creatinine, and then, of course, your hematologic. So looking at these acute, not chronic, Organ dysfunctions can certainly help you determine that they have actual severe sepsis. We can prognosticate in the ER by looking at our patients what our mortality rate was. Derek Angus did this in 2001. He replicated these data in 2005. And I, at my previous facility, replicated these data with my personal sepsis database of 450 patients. I currently have about 259 in my Mission Hospital sepsis database, but I replicated these exact data, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. And the ED nurses, you need to look at your patients and say, you know what, I have altered LOC, my patient's confused, they're tachypnea with increased FiO2 requirements, their blood pressure's you know, in the 80s. We have a 60% mortality patient here. And yet when the trauma is called, all the staff run to the trauma. And so we know that these patients are certainly, they need more attention in the ED. But how do you really know that you have a sepsis patient? Who are these people? We have very common sources. Certainly our chest infected patients, the pneumonias, aspiration pneumonia. I did a quick query on 5070, the ICD-9 codes for pneumonia, and I'm telling you half our ICU patients had an associated um, aspiration pneumonia. The acute abdomens, all the perforated bowels, our abscesses that are sometimes misdiagnosed in the ED. I had a patient with a liver abscess that they thought it was a new cancer, and they completely missed that patient. He went to the regular floors, decompensated on day two, and went to ICU with multi-organ failure because they thought it was a cancer, not an abscess. Cholecystitis, those patients can be very, very sick. The pancreatitis patients, 10% are actually infective. The UTI patients, fully associated UTIs, our pylos can be very, very ill. Any post-surgical wound patient can become septic to cubes, cellulitis. We've had three spinal abscesses come through the ED in the past two years. Those are certainly interesting cases that started out with just a skin abscess. Central line associated blood sepsis infections, meningitis, SBEs, and of course in the critical care unit, all of our critical care patients have a risk of that translocation of the bacteria across the gut associated with ARDS. And we need to always be aware that those patients can turn into severe sepsis septic shock. 